Hello listeners, my name is Alex Castleberry and today I will be presenting my thesis project titled Patty Chang as Oppositional Performer Through the Subversive Abject Body. Upon viewing Patty Chang's feminist video art of the early 21st century, the gaze is met with consequence that subverts the initial gratification of seeing a woman on screen. This essay examines the experience of the spectator through an analysis of abject performances from the early works of this contemporary artist. Chang is an artist known for her performances in front of the camera that clearly subverts the gaze of the voyeur and shatters the illusion of finding pleasure through viewership. These works from the late 1990s dissect the body and the perversions of female identity in an ultimate rejection of scopophilic fantasy. Consequently, there is a resistance to objectification by becoming a masculine spectacle of disgust. Although Chang was working in the late 1990s during a time when the theme of the abject was prevalent, there lacks scholarship and exhibition inclusion in which Chang's use of abjection has explored the concept thoroughly as a way to understand her work. The theoretical work of Julia Kristeva, Jacques Lacan, and Laura Mulvey will be applied to Chang's work. Kristeva's essay, The Powers of Horror, an essay on objection, offers the term of the abject as a contrast to Lacan's object of desire. According to Mulvey, the relationship of the spectator with a woman on screen has always been reserved for the male gaze, though Marianne Doan and Michelle Meager propel the discourse of the female spectator, a theory in which I apply my own viewership of the to the works such as Shaved, At Loss, Hand to Mouth, In Love, and Stage Fright number three. An analysis of Chang's works from 1998 to 2004 through reviews and a personal experience of her exhibitions investigates the abject body as a rejection of boundaries through periodic performances of female repulsion from initial allurement. In this process, I also examine the experience of the spectator, particularly a female identified spectator, and what it means to identify positively with that repulsion and its parody. As a female spectator, I ask the question, how can I feel both disgusted yet captivated in this exhaustive role as a viewer of Chang's work? The shattering of the illusion of pleasure when viewing a woman on screen begins with one of Chang's most well-known performances of the late 1990s as repulsion dominates desire. Chang's 1998 work, Shaved, At Loss, begins with Chang fumbling to find a single chair set between two tables under a red cloth. The artist wears a fitted white lace top resembling an undergarment a long black skirt with an abundance of fabric, and a black blindfold across her eyes. Chang's hair is neatly coiffed and her red lipstick matches the red tablecloth. Chang sets down a beige briefcase and begins rummaging around what appears to be small pill bottles before finding a large glass drinking goblet that she sets down on the table to her right. She then pulls out a bottle of sparkling water and pours it into the glass while feeling around, subtly inviting the viewer to gaze upon the absurdity of the setup. Chang takes sips of the sparkling water before lifting her skirt and rolling up the fabric to reveal her vagina. Rummaging through the suitcase once more, Chang pulls out shaving cream and a razor and begins methodically shaving her pubic hair while blindfolded on this tape. Shave demonstrates the severance of its opposition of I, considering the pubic hair is no longer attached to Chang's body. The unavoidable feeling of repulsion and disgust arises at the sight of, con of a conglomerate of pubic hairs swirling around in a clear glass goblet of sparkling water and freshly diluted shaving cream. It beseeches a discharge, a convulsion, a crying out. There is a simultaneous association found from the purity of the artist and the cleanliness of the water poured into the glass that is met with the disengagement of the artist's own gaze and it is obstructed by fabric and consequently allows the viewer to engage in the deafening tension of such an intimate act. The recorded audio captures the stillness of the mundane sounds 
such as the setting of the goblet on the table, the sips of water, or the transfer of liquid from one glass to another, all while the spectator watches from a safe distance. The initial invitation for the presence of the voyeur is instantly retracted through the methodical removal of hair from the vagina, immediately creating tension and an undeniable reaction upon the scene Chang had deliberately catapulted the viewer into participating in. Through the expulsion of her pubic hair, Chang introduces the detachment of herself and her hair as something that is no longer a part of Chang herself and other. Kristeva states, it is thus not lack of cleanliness or health that causes objection, but what disturbs identity, system, order, what does not respect borders, positions, rules, the in-between, the ambiguous, the composite. Once the pubic hair is no longer on Chang's body, a part of the self is lost. The desire for the other attaches itself to that person as an entire entity, a whole. What was previously pleasurable to view on a human body has now been rejected. The disconnect from Chang to the hair swirling in the glass is again neither subject nor object. It is no longer a part of her. The feeling of disgust and repulsion is similar to that when a head hair is found in a dish that was served to a patron at a restaurant, the way someone spit sizzles on the asphalt in the summertime, or even the moment toenails are groomed and the clippings find themselves on the coffee table. The abject becomes a loss of the self and consequently unrecognizable. The intentional opposition of Chang's early work raises author Michelle Meager's question of what would it mean for a woman, an artist, a spectator, to willingly and excessively embody disgust? Though Meager is not writing about Chang, she uses Kristeva's theory of the abject to delve into the relationship in which a female spectator can recognize and interrogate bodily reactions of disgust. These reactions, Meager argues, stem from the cultural ideals that distorts the perception of the female spectator's own body. This would mean that the feeling of disgust that emerges when viewing an unsettling portrayal of a woman is inherently caused by the act of defying social repressions, likely from the unconscious of a patriarchal society. The feminist aesthetic of disgust exemplifies the ease of becoming disgusting and is the subject to the biological response of repulsion. But where does its power lie? Before I return to the relationship with the female spectator, I must address the concept of female spectacle in psychoanalysis. The female spectacle in film is manifested by socially established demonstration of patriarchal society because the, one, the only role for the female in the Hollywood narrative is as a passive spectacle, according to Mulvey. Mulvey states that phallocentrism dictates how women will be portrayed as their own image on film and examines the feelings of pleasure in looking and how satisfaction for the male viewer can be achieved in dominant patriarchal order. She states, there is an obvious interest in this analysis for feminists a beauty in its exact rendering of the frustration experienced under a phallocentric order. It gets us nearer to the roots of our oppression. It brings an articulation of the problem closer. It faces us with the ultimate challenge, how to fight the unconscious structured like a language while still caught within the language of the patriarchy. In other words, how is it possible to fight the patriarchy in the language of the patriarchy? In her work, Chang has rejected the idea of pleasuring the male viewer as his submissive spectacle. Mulvey states that featuring the female body in a desirable manner further reinforces the unconscious construct of women in cinema, though Chang uses a pre-recorded performance to dismantle some of those constructs within a few minutes. Parodic portrayals of superficial female roles in fetish films in Chang's work hand to mouth, further subverts the gaze as it flirts between the line of desire and disgust. This six minute video displays the female subject as a grotesque spectacle, 
and the viewer is met with the uncomfortable audio and visual elements in a public setting of a museum, all of which disturbs the traditionally masculine scopophilic gaze. Featured in an exhibition from 2019 at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Hand to Mouth plays on a repetitive cycle in the far right corner of a dark, cramped room. It is optional for guests to sit down and place headphones on, but the users can already begin to hear the high-pitched screeches of Chang herself. The artist is dressed in various wigs throughout the performance, and she is fed water-filled helium balloons as she screams for more, more, more. Chang yells, come on, in my face, give it to me, give it to me, as she inhales more helium. Her voice becomes higher pitched. The water from the same balloon is then shaken in front of her face, likely parodying the female lead in a pornographic film in a submissive role. Viewing this work in a public setting immediately gave me the feeling of shame and embarrassment, like I was caught viewing pornography in public and identifying myself as a female spectator, a figure often left out in film analysis. The subversion of my gaze had come from the possibility of dominating the subject with my own viewership, as if the female spectator was not invited either. The male gaze has always been considered the subject and the female image as the object. In the relationship of the female spectator with the female spectacle, the image is theorized in terms of a certain closeness the lack of distance or gap between sign and referent. Too close to herself, entangled in her own enigma, she could not step back, could not achieve the necessary distance of a second look. Mary Ann Doan addresses Freud's omission of the female spectator in his analysis of femininity because according to Freud's psychoanalysis, both women and the image of women are indecipherable and there is not enough gap between the two for the real to emerge. Doan states, psychoanalysis has been activated in feminist film theory primarily in order to dissect and analyze the spectator's physical investment in the film and that the image of a woman in cinema is subservient to voyeuristic and fetishistic impulses. This dismal conclusion is similar to that of Mulvey's, that the agency of a woman in film is dismantled by her own presence to the viewer. Under Chang's contemporary circumstances, largely within the same decade as Doan's text, her work aims to reject the subjectification of the voyeur. In Hand to Mouth, Chang takes autonomy in where the viewer can view this work. Public exhibitions such as Read My Lips of 2019 become inherently confrontational because Chang parodies a fetish film. The exaggeration of the fetishized female exemplifies some of the absurdity and shaping of a woman on film. The female spectator often finds these portrayals as a demeaning caricature of themselves and therefore they have not been invited to see their own image. The human form on screen is at least in some way the same form of the spectator as a woman, and this relationship no longer identifies as neither subject and one as object. Thus, Freud's isolation of female iconic representation cannot survive if nobody is being objectified. Chang's parody of both herself and countless representations of women in fetish films is not pleasurable for any gender because this performance makes it difficult to ignore, ignore the absurd act that is publicized, no longer in the privacy of one's own home. By screaming for more and to give it to me, there is a disruption of the idea of being the peeping Tom behind the screen, the spectator's position in relation to the woman on screen. Due to the location of contemporary art institution, the voyeur is being watched. Another uncomfortable situation in which Chang's work was viewed in public was during an exhibition featuring In Love. Recorded in 2001, In Love features Chang sharing an onion with both of her parents on two different channel screens playing side by side. The video begins with Chang and her mother on one screen, and the artist and her father on the other. 
They are staring at one another against a bright yellow backdrop as the camera is intrusively zoomed in on all of the subjects' faces. The videos of Chang's mother and her father are played side by side and the films are intentionally run backward so that each couple appears to be kissing in a disturbingly passionate exchange between parent and child until the evidence of an onion begins to take shape between them, Lee's Hosen writes in this review. Viewing this work in public is similarly unpleasant to that of witnessing hand-to-mouth at a live exhibition, though In Love explores intergenerational intimacy as the onion is passed back and forth from child to parent, and as they cry, they add to the disconcerting sense of intimacy created by the proximity of the characters. In a short video by Nicholas Jenkins, Chang is interviewed while riding a bicycle through a park to speak on how she approached the subject for In Love. Chang states in the interview, Who in the world for me would be the worst person to do this video with? And I decided it was my parents because this is a very horrible, intimate thing. She then explained how she called her parents to describe them her ideas for In Love though she expressed concern in regards to her father not caring for onions. Chang is shown kissing her father as she talks about the pain caused from eating the onion, stating that it was miserable, yet part of the process. It just becomes from bad to worse and worse. It's all relative, really. To be a spectator to this work is to be projected into a distressing situation that subverts the gaze from any sense of fantasy as it verges on an incestuous situation. This demonstrates the confrontational nature of the video as it dissolves the caricature of performance to fully display the intimate kissing of Chang and both of her parents for four strenuous minutes. Chang says of her work, it is uncomfortable for reasons that we have created, so it speaks more to the general culture than specifically in the actions I am doing. In another collaborative work, Chang explores even more anxieties of everyday life through a video installation featuring a grueling food binging and vomiting session with a man named Todd. Stage fright number three of 2004 is shown side by side again. Chang and her male collaborator are seen on the toilet of a linoleum tiled bathroom beneath unflattering lighting in evening wear that has clearly become disheveled throughout the night. Todd's tie is pushed over his left shoulder and Chang's cocktail dress straps fall below her shoulders. Both participants are breathing heavily as they gorge on junk foods such as donuts, malt balls, sodas, cakes, sausages, and cookies. Chang and Todd are filming their own performances while watching Alfred Hitchcock's thriller Stage Fright that can be heard over the plastic packaging opening and the occasional grunting and sniffling. Later in the videos, Todd begins to light a cigarette as he sits on the toilet while Chang first inserts a maraschino cherry attached to a green toothpick into her cigarette. The juice from the cherry bleeds into the paper wrap of the cigarette while the phone rings in Hitchcock's film. In a Roberts Projects press release for the video installation, the unnamed author for Roberts and Tilton said of the piece, the obsessive and excessive nature of consumption alternates between boredom and anxiety. The act of vomiting this junk food is the ultimate self-rejection a performed eating disorder that reacts against social norms in a public bathroom while rejecting an entire part of the self as a result within being. Abjection, at the crossroads of phobia, obsession, and perversion, shares in the same arrangement. The loathing that is implied in it does not take on the aspect of the hysteric conversion. The latter is the symptom of an ego that, overtaxed by a bad object, turns away from it cleanses itself of it, vomits it. Chang parodies the image of a woman through an exaggerated rejection, a complete subversion, and opposition. Particularly in Hand to Mouth and Stage Fright number 3, 
Chang takes her predetermined subjectivity as a woman on screen and demolishes the voyeur's expectation of being invited to gaze upon her as an object. The viewer initially imposes his idea of a woman represented on screen, but is quickly met with a reality that directly opposes the grotesque through the discharge of bodily fluids, indulgent consumption, or a mockery of high-pitched screaming. The patriarchal language we are caught in repeatedly contributes to either a complete omission or a poor representation of women's lives. Chang experiences the cultural dilemma of growing up in Southern California, born to Chinese parents and immediately subject to stereotypes and alluring representations of her body through continual oppression. While that only complicates a viewer's perception, the glaring focus is on Chang's contradicting display of femininity. Through her work, Chang subverts the hegemonic masculinist cultures that challenge the, fe the female-male binary, insisting that the restrictions for the female artists like Chang are arbitrary and far too limiting. This quest also allows her to challenge social constructions and cultural imaginings of women and culture. Chang's inherent dismissal of the preconceived image of a woman on screen challenges all forms of representation in how we are led to this ideal in the first place. From Freud's total omission of the female spectator and the Lacanian language of the ideals that make one cisgender different from another and therefore comparable, these representations are what Chang seeks to dismantle in contemporary video art. In her work, Chang does not allow the audience to seek comfort through the female spectacle. The artist forces a confrontation of that initial allurement as the viewer is unexpectedly met with repulsion in their own voyeurism. The confrontation is especially apparent in public exhibitions because one is no longer comfortable gazing at a young woman on screen if she is not acting as a spectacle of pleasure. Chang's parodies allow for a twisted humorous aspect to coexist with the presence of abjection as she opposes the viewer, her own self, and her relationship with outdated scholarship that lacks representation. When dealing with shaving her pubic hair in shaved, swapping saliva with her parents during In Love, or vomiting junk food in Stage Fright number 3, Chang is imposing her bodily autonomy onto the viewer and intentionally subverting the gaze by abjecting a part of her own self. The hair, spit, and vomit are no longer a part of herself, and this subversiveness is divisive in the opposition of the perversion instilled in all of us upon viewing a woman on screen. And upon viewing Chang's work, there are consequences.